Okay, well, I just flew in. I came straight from the airport. I managed to do a lot of reading on the plane. And that puts me always in a good mood. <laughs> so uh, I hope the evening will go smoothly. Uh, the topic of my discussion or my remarks this evening is to some extent underwhelming. Namely, the topic I want to look at is <clears throat> Why is a conflict which, if you look at the documentary record, if you look at the human rights record, the conflict is remarkably uncontroversial. There's very little disagreement on the historical record any longer. There's very little disagreement among historians on what happened. There's very little, if any, disagreement among human rights organizations about what's currently happening. And in fact, there is almost no disagreement on how to resolve the conflict. Now, the question is, if what I'm saying is true, and part of the burden of tonight's remarks is to demonstrate that that's true, if what I'm saying is true, then how do you account for in the public arena, in public life, so much controversy swirling around the Israel-Palestine conflict. And the argument I'm going to make this evening is, in my view, most of what constitutes controversy on the Israel-Palestine conflict is contrived. It's fabricated. It's concocted, the purpose being to divert people from the real issues, to divert people from the factual record, and to sow confusion about what's going on, what has gone on, what's going on, and how to resolve the conflict. That's going to be the argument I'm going to make this evening. Let me back up for a moment and begin with one illustration of, the main, of one of the main arguments I want to make this evening. Let's turn to the July 2004 decision of the World Court, the International Court of Justice, <coughs> excuse me, the most authoritative judicial body in the world. In July 2004, the World Court rendered a landmark advisory opinion on the wall that Israel was building and continues to build in the occupied territories. It happens, however, that the World Court took it upon itself not just to render a decision, an opinion, on the legality of the wall, but they addressed probably all the outstanding, all the main issues bearing on the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict, certainly since 1967. And they rendered judgments on all aspects of that history. For example, the World Court began by pointing out, under Article 2 of the United Nations Charter, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. It's the famous uh, preamble to UN Resolution 242, the inadmissibility of acquiring territory by war. The World Court affirmed that what they called UN Charter Principle, and therefore concluded that all the territories which Israel acquired during the June 1967 war to all those territories, Israel had no legal claim whatsoever. They had no claim to even an atom of sovereignty <clears throat> over the West Bank, Jerusalem, and Gaza. And the World Court went further and said those areas are designated for Palestinian self-determination. <clears throat> And accordingly, throughout their advisory opinion, 
they refer to those areas, the whole of Gaza, the whole of the West Bank, and Jerusalem. They refer to them as occupied Palestinian territories, uppercase O, uppercase P, uppercase T. Now, if you look in the public media in the United States, for example, they are never referred to, literally never referred to, as occupied Palestinian territories. Their official designation in the US now, since September 1993, their official designation changed to disputed territories. Namely, there is a controversy over who has sovereignty over them. Not so, says the World Court. There is no controversy whatsoever. They are occupied Palestinian territories. Number two, the World Court rendered a decision on the legality of the settlements. And they stated unequivocally, without ambiguity, that under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, all the settlements are illegal under international law. That is to say, all 400,000 settlers in the West Bank and Jerusalem, they have to leave under international law. There is no controversy. Number three, the question of Jerusalem. You're often told in the public arena, in the public media, that Jerusalem is a controversial and complicated question. And some even say it's Israel's eternal capital. The World Court is very clear. Jerusalem is, and they say it over and over again, occupied Palestinian territory. Period. Full stop. No qualification. And number four, the World Court rules, as you, some of you will probably know, that the wall Israel is building in the occupied territories is illegal under international law. It has to be dismantled, compensation paid for damages wrought to the Palestinians, and the international community has a legal obligation to see that the wall is dismantled. That's the World Court decision. What's even, what's as remarkable as the range of their opinion and the uh, fact that it bore on most of the uh, crucial aspects of the Israel-Palestine conflict was the kind of consensus that was reached. Unusually for the World Court, the vote was 14 to 1, the one dissenting vote being the American judge, Thomas Bergenthal. But even before you sneer at that, it's interesting to see what Bergenthal had to say. First, let me make a one comment about the 14 who voted in favor. This was not a rubber stamp court. It was not a kangaroo court. It had some quite independent, or has, some quite independent feisty members. There's, for example, Judge Ruth Higgins, the British judge on the court. And she happens to be Jewish. She married an Irishman. She herself is Jewish. And she delivered her own separate opinion among the majority opinion. It works like our own Supreme Court, where you have a majority opinion, but judges can, if they don't concur with the main decision, can write their separate opinion. And Judge Higgins delivered or wrote her own separate opinion. And she expressed disagreement with the reasoning of the majority opinion on this point and that point. Nonetheless, on all the issues I just accounted for, she voted with the majority. Let's now take the case of the one dissenting vote. 
namely Thomas Bergenthal. Bergenthal was very careful in his use of language. He did not call his dissenting opinion a dissent. He called it a declaration. And he began his declaration by saying, even though I voted in the negative, there are many aspects of the world court decision, the majority opinion, I happen to agree with. For our purposes, the most important comes at the end of his separate opinion. He states that there can be no question that the settlements are all illegal under international law. That is cut and dried, clear and shut. And he went on to say, if the wall is being built to incorporate the settlements, it is, and now I'm quoting him, ipso facto, if the settlements are illegal, the wall is ipso facto illegal under international law. Now it happens a couple of months ago, the Israel High Court, not to be confused with the International Court of Justice, the Israel High Court, no, I'm serious, you no, know, you start throwing out these acronyms and people get confused. The Israel High Court rendered its second principal judgment on the wall. And the majority decision uh, written by Judge Barak, he flat out said, the wall is being built to protect the settlements. Once he acknowledged that, now according to Barak, that's legal. But once he acknowledged that, it now is all 15 judges agree. The wall is illegal because the settlements are illegal. Now that's quite remarkable. It shows you how what is taken to be controversial issues in the United States are in fact not really controversial at all. And that's what I want to look at this evening, namely, how does that come to pass? Fifteen feisty independent judges looking at the legal side of this issue, they all agree on the principal questions. And yet, in the United States, we're told settlements, Jerusalem, borders, even the wall, we're told they're very controversial questions. OK, in order to set the stage, so to speak, for my remarks tonight, I'm going to have you uh, bear with a little personal history. Not that my autobiography should be of any interest to anyone in this room. It barely interests me most of the time. <laughs> However, there are some aspects of it, the, rel the relevance of which will become uh, clear, I think, at the end of my remarks. I first became involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict uh, at the time of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in June 1982. I had been active politically, but on the, and a person of the left, which I remain. I don't know if the left remains, but I remain a person <laughs> of the left. Um, I um, had been involved in uh, political, other sorts of political activities, not the Israel-Palestine conflict. I had basically read what every good leftist was supposed to read back then on the topic books by fellows like Maxime Rodinson, for those who go back that far. And, other, and I had the politically correct line on the topic, which is to say I didn't know anything about it. Uh, come June 1982, uh, I'm, I, like several fellow Jews, are appalled by the Israeli invasion in Lebanon and the havoc uh, and murder and mayhem it was causing there. And I joined a little group. We were called uh, JMO, Jews Against the Israeli Massacre in Lebanon. JMO, it was an ugly acronym, highly indicative of the group. 
<laughs> I used to say that after Sabra and Shatila, the second biggest catastrophe of the war was Jamal. Uh, nonetheless, uh, even though politically we didn't always get along, uh, it was a, a source of intellectual stimulation, I would say. And one topic which constantly cropped up in the course of our <coughs> short existence was, are you now or have you ever been? Not are you now or have you ever been a communist, but are you now or have you ever been a Zionist? And I was actually neutral on the topic. I am old fashioned. I think you should read and study before you take a position on something. I do believe that it's important to have passion and the heart, but there's also a place for the mind in politics. Have not, having not read on the topic, I was resistant to taking a position. One of my favorite lines from that fellow named Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, in one of his famous essays on uh, investigating the peasant rebellions, I guess, in Hunan province, I always used to quote the line, no investigation, no right to speak. If you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. Uh, so, uh, unlike most professors, uh, even though I wasn't yet a professor, though we know most professors are windbags. Uh, so, I then proceeded to study fairly extensively the subject of Zionism. And after about a year into the subject, I decided I was what they call ABD, all but dissertation. And I decided that this would be as interesting a dissertation topic as any. And I submitted it as my dissertation proposal. And then I did another year of study. And by 1984, I was about to embark on the stage of writing, which as anyone who's ever gone through the process knows, is a dreadful moment where you have to make sense of your research and you look for every excuse not to get to the writing stage, mostly by saying, I found another book. I found another book that I have to read. In my case, I didn't have to look for a pretext because the pretext, as it were, came to me. One day in April 1984, I walked into what was then called the Harper and Row, now it's Harper Collins, the Harper and Row bookstore, and sitting on the shelf, prominently displayed, was this very fat volume called From Time Immemorial, The Origins of the Arab-Jewish Conflict Over Palestine. And I picked it up, of course. It seemed uh, related to my dissertation topic. And I turned to the back. And there was a very impressive roster of endorsements. It was like a who's who of American arts and letters. At the top was Barbara Tuckman, the famed historian of the guns in August. She said, or guns in August, she said the book was, quote, a historical event in itself. And then there was an endorsement by the well-known Holocaust historian Lucy DeWittowich, followed one by the Nobel laureate uh, Saul Bellow, the Nobel laureate in literature, followed by the Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel in peace. What he actually did, nobody knows, but uh, he had an endorsement for the book, um, and so on down the line. And very rapidly, the book became a national bestseller Joan Peters was giving, I think, on the order of 250 speaking engagements. And the reviews for the book, as they poured in, ranged all the way from ecstasy to awe. So for example, Martin Peretz, then as now, the editor and publisher of the New Republic, he said, this book, if read, will change the history of the future whatever that meant, but it sounded, <laughs> it sounded portentous. And the truth be told, 
academics write like that. Um, and truth be told, if what Peter said was true, if what she said were, was true, if what she said was true, uh, it would have changed dramatically our understanding of the conflict. Because her claim was that Palestine had been empty on the eve of Zionist colonization. The Jews came, proverbially made the desert bloom, and then all these Arabs from neighboring countries surreptitiously entered Palestine, sneaked into Palestine to take advantage of the new economic opportunities, and then pretended to be indigenous. <laughs> that all of these Palestinians, or people who call themselves Palestinian, had fabricated their genealogies. And the book came, as Peters liked to boast, with 1,850 endnotes, as well as a very, or what seemed to be, a very sophisticated uh, demographic study, which was endorsed by the head of population studies at the University of Chicago, a fellow named Philip Hausner, or Hauser. Uh, yes. Well, even though many in this audience, when I stated her thesis, laughed and sneered, I would have to say in all candor, I did not. Why? Because in my youth, I had some deeply held convictions and beliefs, which I thought were solidly grounded in scholarship and history. Those beliefs I read an enormous amount on before reaching those convictions, or at any rate, certifying those convictions. I was 100% certain I was right, and when, or 101% certain I was right. And anyone who disagreed with me, I was quick to, to dismiss them as victims of bourgeois propaganda, as we called it back then. And whenever I entertained any doubts on those rare moments when I doubted my beliefs, I would always think, but this authority who taught economics at Harvard, or this famed historian who's at the Sorbonne, or the, the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes, the elite institution in Paris, they have the same beliefs as me. So I can't be wrong. <laughs> Because back then, for those of you who are older, I just couldn't believe Paul Sweezy, so well educated, so erudite, I couldn't believe uh, Paul Sweezy could be wrong. And I couldn't believe Charles Bettelheim could be wrong. So whenever I had doubts, I would just remember, remember what Sweezy said, remember what Bettelheim said. Well, as it happens sometimes, History can be a very cruel teacher, and all the bricks can come falling on your head. And sometime in the late 1970s, the bricks came falling on my head, and I realized I was, in fundamental ways, wrong. How wrong, I don't know. As I was telling a fellow here before the evening began, barely a day passes when I don't still try to figure out how wrong I was. On bad days, I have to concede at least 70% wrong. <laughs> On good days, I'll concede 20% wrong. But wrong, I certainly was. And so when this book came along, the Joan Peters book, many people in my, as it were, camp on the left dismissed it not as bourgeois propaganda, but as Zionist propaganda. And they all went their merry ways and ignored the book. I was not prepared to do so. I did not want to be made a fool of a second time.
it not, it's not just being wrong politically, it's very wounding to the ego when you treat, other, treat others with such contempt and then discover they were right and you were wrong. And I was not going to make that mistake again. And so I went after Joan Peters's from time immemorial like Captain Ahab went after Moby Dick. <laughs> I went through all those footnotes, all 1853. I plopped myself down in the New York City Public Library Research Branch, one of the great research institutions in the world, and I started going through those footnotes. And when I came home at night after work, I would sit down on my bed or lie down on my bed, take out a pad and paper, and try to figure out her demographic study. And it was written in this dense, almost impenetrable prose. And you had to keep correlating the chapters with the charts at the end, the charts with the chapters, chapters with the charts. I'm flipping back, flipping back, flipping back and forth for several consecutive nights. But I'm determined. I am going to figure out whether what she's saying is true. And then one night, it was about 1.30 in the morning, the chill down my spine, my eyes start to water, I realize my heart begins to palpitate. I realize the key number in her study is a fake. It's not just a mistake. It's not just an error. The way the material was arranged on the charts, it's clear the number was faked. And you can imagine that exhilarating feeling I had, my good friend Paul Sweezy later said to me, discovering a fraud is every scholar's eureka. And <laughs> this was my eureka moment. I got up off my bed and I started pacing my studio apartment. I was a poor graduate student. I'm not doing much better now. Uh, I started pacing my apartment, uh, pumping my arm. I did it. I did it. I did it. And, you know, it's a, in the post-Oprah age, we call it wanting to share the good news. I wanted to tell someone. It's 1.30 in the morning. I don't know who to call. But after all, I am Jewish, so I called my mother. <laughs> and at 1.30 in the morning, I rang up my mother. And I said, Mom, I did it. I did it. I did it. And like a good Jewish mother, she said, I'm very proud of you. I'm very happy for you. What did you do? <laughs> and I. You know, I had to then tell her that rather underwhelming news that I had found a fake number in the demographic study. <laughs> it didn't seem to warrant waking her up. I still think it was an occasion to do so. And then I um, uh, proceeded to send out, distribute my findings. And the truth is, uh, for those of you who are now entertaining illusions about my brilliance, I have to say, in fact, the fraud was so gross and so silly that it didn't take really any intelligence at all to figure it out. In fact, I began doing the research in May or June, and it was already all complete and a full monograph written by December. And most of it was just tracking down sources after work, going to the library and tracking down sources. The real challenge was not documenting the fraud. The real challenge was publicizing it. Because so many institutions and individuals had become invested in the book, having lent their names to this historical event in itself, which will change the history of the future, <laughs> that how would it look if some graduate student who had only been studying the topic for literally two years, from 1980, you could say from July 82 to 1984, 
who had only been studying the topic for two years, was able to figure out that the book was a threadbare hoax. It didn't exactly put all of those experts and authorities in the best light. And it became a real struggle, which lasted for two years, until 1986, until there was any public acknowledgment that the book was a fake. Uh, and from there on in, I became, most of my public life has been involved in the issue, my political life has been involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict. And fairly recently, uh, I passed an anniversary, 20 years of involvement in the topic. And it was, of course, an occasion, uh, as any milestone like that is, an occasion for reflection, not least the reflection of you spent so many years reading on this topic, and it almost seems pitiful. We have such a big world out there, leaving aside for the moment the universe, and you've devolved 20 years reading incessantly on this subject, and what do you, what do you learn from it? And I came, as I said at the beginning, to the underwhelming conclusion that the main thing I learned from it is the conflict really isn't complicated. It's really pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And that most of what co what's passes for controversy and complication is contrived, a politically motivated contrivance to confuse the issues and to divert attention from the real facts and the real history. Now, let me try to illustrate that point, that the history is really not that complicated. Let me try to illustrate it with a few examples. Let's look at the case of the history first. Uh, there was a time, and there are some older people in the room, there was a time when you can say that in scholarship there were real differences of opinion on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, there was what you can call a mainstream opinion, pretty much dominated by Israel and its supporters. And you can see the version of that history in, for example, Leon Uris's Exodus, which is pretty much the version of the history most people grew up with until the 1980s. Most of the scholarship on the topic <coughs> up until the late 1980s you could call Uris with footnotes. That's basically what it was. And there was also a small dissenting body of scholarship, uh, people on the fringes, but they had next to no impact on the way people perceived the conflict. Let's take an example. One of the standard questions that always arose, and to some extent still does, though not in scholarship, was how did those Palestinians become refugees in 1948? And the standard interpretation was that the Arab armies before entering Palestine poised to invade the newly born Jewish state, had transmitted radio messages telling the Palestinians to flee, and that once they had swept the Jews into the sea, the Palestinians could return. And that was called the Arab radio broadcasts explanation of the Palestinian refugee question. And some of you who are older will, of course, remember that. Some of you who um, read Israel propaganda will also remember that today. Uh, now, in fact, it was already well known as early as the 1960s that that just wasn't true because there were a couple of good scholars, one named Walid Khalidi, a second named Erskine Childers. They went back and checked the tapes which were kept of the radio broadcasts in 1948. Various intelligence agencies were monitoring the area during the war. The tapes were preserved. They went back, checked the tapes, 
there was no evidence of these broadcasts. Rather the contrary, all the radio broadcasts, at least from March 1948 on, instructed the Palestinians to stay where they are. But it had almost no impact, as I said, on mainstream understanding. Come the late 1980s, a number of Israeli scholars, most notably Benny Morris, uh, now of Ben-Gurion University. Benny Morris checks through some of the Israeli archives which were then opened, and he reaches the conclusion based on the Israeli side, the evidence, that there's no evidence for these Arab radio broadcasts. And he says basically his famous formulation was that the Arab Refu the Palestinian refugee question was born of war, not by design. Namely, that they became the victims of a war, a conflict. And Benny Morris now, he freely speaks about what happened in 1948, his phrase, not mine. He speaks of it as an ethnic cleansing. The Palestinians were ethnically cleansed in 1948. And in fact, most Israeli scholars now in the mainstream are saying that or a near equivalent. The most remarkable addition to those scholars I just came across, some of you know the Israeli former foreign minister, Shlomo Ben Ami. And Shlomo Ben Ami was the one who negotiated the Camp David and Taba uh, uh, talks on the Israeli side. He just came out with a book, Oxford University Press. Apart from being Israel's former foreign minister, he also is a noted historian. His field is the Spanish Civil War, but he's solid, clearly solid. And if you pick up his book, you will see in the first 50 pages, he goes through the history of the conflict, and he says it's not, he doesn't say it's true, he simply states as fact. The Palestinians were expelled in 1948. It was part of what he calls the Zionist ideology of transfer. And he goes beyond Morris, which I found interesting. He goes beyond Morris and states that this was premeditated, intended. It was not an accident of war. It was done with premeditation in accordance with the Zionist ideology. Now, it is true, it is true that there are differences about how the refugees became refugees. Some say it was done, it was a happenstance of war like Morris, and then others, including <coughs> Israel's recent foreign minister, who says no, it was done with premeditation and intention. The range of difference now on that crucial question and what used to be one of the most controversial questions, the range of difference is very narrow. The official Israeli interpretations about Arab radio broadcasts and all that nonsense, it's fallen off the spectrum. It's no longer a part of serious academic or scholarly discussion. The only thing that really remains was, is how much, it, how much of it was premeditated, how much of it was uh, uh, an accident of war. For those of you who are interested, it was a surprise to me how much Shlomo Ben Ami took from my work on the topic. Now, for those of you who think that's a uh, act of uh, uh, arrogance on my part, I do post on my website a large number of pages where I juxtapose what he says, what I say, what he says, what I say. Not in any way to denigrate his scholarship, which is not my interest at all. What was most interesting to me was on the strictly factual scholarly questions regarding the history we barely disagreed at all. And when I had occasion to debate him for a couple of hours about two weeks ago, the debate was very civil, mutually respectful, and the questions of history
there was practically no disagreement. Now that, I think, is an interesting insight. We're always told how complicated that history is, and there is a Palestinian narrative, and there is a Jewish narrative, and the two narratives can't be bridged. But that's not true at all. There is now a growing, a broad consensus among all scholars, Palestinian, Jewish, Israeli, Zionist, on what happened in the past 120 years. Let's now turn to the current situation. That is to say, what is happening in the occupied territories now? And the best source for that is, of course, the human rights reports. And for the book I just published, I had occasion to go through thousands of pages of human rights reports to get a sense of what is the opinion on the various questions that constantly come up in regard to the, palace, in regard to the occupied territories. Now, it's an interesting point that the um, Israel-Palestine conflict is among the most heavily monitored conflicts by human rights organizations in the world. You have the big human rights organizations, like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, which put out a large number of reports. Then you have the local affiliates of larger organizations, like Physicians for Human Rights in Israel, the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, and then you have the locally based human rights organizations. On the Israeli side, most famously, Beth Selim, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, and the Palestinian side, Al Haq, and a couple of others. Now, human rights law is a relatively new division of international law which means there are many areas of disagreement about the application of the law, about the meaning of the law, and so forth. Number two, a large amount of human rights documentation consists of what field workers observe at, say, a demonstration. So there is a demonstration. On this side is the Palestinians. On that side is the Israeli army. Field workers go out, and they look first at the Palestinian side. Did the Palestinians initiate the Malay? And if they did, did they throw stones, or did they use live ammunition? And if live ammunition was used, was it by militants in the crowd or at the side of the crowd? All of those questions come up. And then they turn to the Israeli side. Did the army initiate the Malay? And if they did, were they in a life-threatening position when they began to use their weapons? And if they were in a life-threatening position, did they aim at the legs? Did they aim at the torso? Did they aim at the head? Those are the sorts of questions they ask. Why do I mention this? I said human rights law is still a little bit, as it were, fuzzy. And we all know that the human capacity for observation is flawed. Some of you know the film, the famous Kurosawa film, Rashomon. Several people watch the same incident and remember it entirely differently. So my expectation was, when I opened up these human rights reports, my expectation was there would be a lot of disagreement. There would be disagreement about the application of the law, and there would be disagreement about the facts on the ground. What was really, I would say, I won't call it a startling revelation, because that sounds too dramatic, but it certainly was a surprise for me that looking at the human rights reports over a 20-year period, basically starting with roughly around 1985 to the present, I only found one incident, one demonstration in the Palestinian town of Hebron, one incident 
where two human rights organizations disagreed about what happened in a demonstration. I mean that, and I'm willing to take a um, uh, polygraph on that. That's all I found. I was kind of shocked. There is no disagreement about what is going on there. And when I reported this finding and documented the course across about 250 pages in the book I just completed, recently a very hostile reviewer in the um, Middle East Journal, a fellow named Mark Saperstein, whose field of expertise is ancient Jewish texts, which of course qualifies him perfectly to review my book. Um, Mark Saperstein was appalled by my conclusions because he asked, why wasn't there a weighing of evidence on both sides of a controversial issue? And my simple response is, because it's not controversial. All the human rights organizations agree on all the major questions from targeted assassinations to torture to house demolitions and so, so forth down the line. There's no evidence to weigh if everyone agrees. Let's turn to the third aspect, namely, that was, we gone, we've looked at the history, we have looked at the current situation, the future how to resolve the conflict. And we're often told that's also a very controversial question. What does the record show? The record shows for the past 30 years, roughly, there has been a consensus in the international community on how to resolve the conflict. Most of you in the room will know it as a general formula the two-state settlement. And the two-state settlement is fairly straightforward. It's embodied, or part of it, is embodied in the famous UN Resolution 242, which starts out by saying, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war, which means Israel must fully withdraw from all the territories it conquered in the June 67 war. And on the Palestinian and Arab side generally, the requirement is that Israel should be recognized as a state in the region with the right to live in peace and security with its neighbors. That's the effective quid pro quo. Full withdrawal on the Israeli side, full recognition on the Palestinian Arab side. That's the essence of the two-state settlement with, of course, the right of Palestinians to exercise self-determination in the areas from which Israel withdraws. It's not controversial. Let's take a few examples. 1989, the UN General Assembly votes on a resolution effectively calling for a two-state settlement. The vote is 151 to three. The whole world on one side, the United States, Israel, and the island state of Dominica on the other side. <laughs> That's it, 151 to three. Now, if you fast forward to 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, the world has dramatically changed. There will have been what you can honestly, what you can correctly call world historic changes in the world and the map. Um, the the uh, disappearance of a whole social system, the Soviet type system, and attendant on that, the emergence of approximately 40 new nation states. In 1989, there were 154 nation states in the UN. Now there, in the United Nations, now there are 191. So both, so geopolitically, the world has dramatically changed. What's quite striking, however, is that the consensus 
on resolving the conflict, the two-state settlement, as I described it, remains remarkably stable. So for example, if you look at the votes for the years 2001 to 4, it's always the whole world on one side and seven dissents on the other. Every year it's always the same. The United States, Israel, Nauru, N-A-U-R-U, Palu, P-A-L-A-U, Tuvalu, T-U-V-A-L-U, Micronesia, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. And that's it. The whole world versus islands. Uh, Nauru's uh, main export is guano, the sophisticated name for bird droppings. Uh, Tuvalu, we shouldn't have to worry, belabor ourselves with because it's disappearing due to global warming. And I'm not sure. Uh, that's it. Uh, so even at the political level, the level of resolving the conflict, which is often said to be the most complicated aspect of the conflict, in fact, there is no controversy at all. In fact, the World Court decision effectively, in combination with the consensus in the UN, put an end to any controversy on the conflict. And that now brings me to the obvious question. If what I'm saying so far is true, then how do you account for the controversy, which, we're told, which appears to swirl around the conflict? And I would say there are two kinds of controversy bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict. One, for lack of a better term, I would call legitimate controversy, which is simply to say, things that honest people can agree to disagree about. And then the illegitimate controversy, which I think is by far the preponderant element. Let me begin with the legitimate controversy. Uh, let's go back to that refugee question. You can agree on the facts. And as I said, there is a broad consensus on how the Palestinians became refugees. You can agree on the facts, but reach altogether different <coughs> moral conclusions. Well, how can that be? Let's take the case of that fellow I mentioned a few moments ago, namely Benny Morris, the person who's most responsible for clarifying the historical record on the Palestinian refugees. He freely acknowledges what happened in 1948 was an ethnic cleansing. About that, he doesn't uh, dispute. But he goes on to say, I think sometimes ethnic cleansings are good things. They're not always bad things. He has a different moral judgment. He says, for example, I think, and now I'm quoting him, the annihilation of the native population in North America was a good thing because it made possible the founding of the great American Republic. That's um, a different moral judgment. Uh, and similarly, Alan Dershowitz uh, of Harvard, uh, he says that ethnic cleansings are, to quote him, a fifth rate moral issue uh, analogous to massive urban renewal. Well, there's no dispute here about the facts. It's a different moral judgment. And you can't say, as you would with facts, that they are right or wrong. The most you can say is they're different. Uh, in this case, you can also say they are Nazi moral judgments, but they are moral <laughs> judgments. Well. If you now leave people like Mr. Uh, Morris and Mr. Dershowitz aside, and you return to the moral universe of normal human beings, <laughs> you, can agree, you can agree on the facts. You can agree in your moral judgments. You can agree in your legal judgments. But you can disagree in your political judgments.
Well, how can that be? Doesn't your political judgment flow from your legal and moral and factual judgments? Well, not really. Let's take those refugees again and use the example of Professor Chomsky. Professor Chomsky does not dispute, because there's no grounds to dispute, rational grounds, that what happened to Palestinians in 1948 was an ethnic cleansing. And he will go on to say that morally, that was a colossal crime. Legally, he will agree, because it's the case, that the Palestinians have a right to return to their homes. Many of you will be surprised to learn, I think, that that is not a controversial question. There is no disagreement among mainstream human rights organizations about the Palestinian right of return. Conservative human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, in the year 2000, they issued, at the time of the Camp David negotiations, they issued statements on the right of return. And I know from talking to people there, there was a lot of internal debate and discussion about how to handle that question. But once the legal researchers began to investigate, they all came to the same conclusion. Go to the internet, look it up. Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, 2000 on the right of return. They all agree there can be no question that Palestinians have the right to all, I won't say all five to six million, there is a certain element of ambiguity there, but certainly the preponderance of Palestinians have the right to return to their homes or in its environs. Professor Chomsky, well aware of that, acknowledges legally the Palestinians have the right to return. But, or however, he says, politically, I don't think it's feasible. I don't think it's going to happen. And he says, in view of that fact, to wave in front of Palestinians, say, in Lebanese refugee camps, that they're going to return, when in fact, as he puts it, everyone knows they're not, he says that's morally irresponsible. Now, I think, as I said, I think that's a legitimate disagreement. Honest people can disagree on that question. Political judgment is exactly that. You weigh different factors and then you decide what is and what isn't feasible, what is and what isn't possible. If it truly is impossible, then I do agree it would be morally, uh, morally uh, unacceptable, I won't call it reprehensible, morally unacceptable to create hopes and wishes where there's no possibility of realizing them. On the other hand, if it is feasible, then you have the right to struggle for it, and you shouldn't be denigrated for trying to struggle for that goal. I think honest people can disagree on that question. Uh, I want to emphasize, though, that even if we agree that that's an area of legitimate disagreement without deciding who's right and who's wrong, and I'm not deciding that. I'm just saying I think it's an area of legitimate disagreement. We have to remember that that's only one aspect of the political resolution of the conflict. And on the big picture, how to resolve it, there's no disagreement at all. It's very clear. If you look at the record, uh, the two-state settlement, in the form I described it, that is to say, a full Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem, and then mutual recognition between a newly created Palestinian state and an Israeli state. Excuse me. I'm just slightly dehydrated from the uh, plane. OK, that's the um, legitimate disagreement. Now, the burden of the rest of this evening's remarks is the illegitimate disagreement. <laughs> 
the contrived, fabricated, concocted disagreement. And I think there are basically three kinds of illegitimate or fabricated disagreement. The first kind is this effort to mystify the conflict, to pretend that this conflict is so complicated that you have to have an understanding the equivalent of rocket science to penetrate its mysteries, that it's about this cosmic clash of civilizations, a cosmic clash of religions. It's about biblical enmities and hatreds that stretch back to the hoary past. Those are the sorts of things we're often told. And in fact, this effort to mystify the conflict has a very useful political purpose. Number one, it gets the observer to suspend his normal moral impulses and judgments. So if you see Israel blowing up homes in the occupied territories as a form of punishment, the only country in the world which legalized house demolitions except for, for a brief period, Iraq under Saddam Hussein. If you see Israel systematically and methodically torture Palestinian detainees, the only country in the world to have legalized torture, and your normal, your normal impulse is to be appalled and outraged. But then you're told, but you don't understand. The conflict is much more complicated than that, as if its complication is somehow a mitigation of what your normal, ordinary, moral impulses tell you. The second purpose of this mystifying of the conflict is you're told that it's so complicated, so impenetrable, that it cannot be compared. Do not compare. And there's a very good reason why you're told not to compare. Because if you make the ordinary comparisons, the obvious comparisons, Israel comes out on the wrong side. So if you compare it with, say, what happened to the Native Americans in North America, it's not an exact analogy, but analogies are never exact. That's why they're called analogies. Uh, but it's not a bad analogy either. I wrote a large part of one book devoted to comparing the fate of the Palestinians with the fate of the Cherokee Indians. And actually, the analogy worked, I think, quite well. But in the analogy, Israel comes out on the wrong side. So do not compare. Or you take not the history, but the current situation. Another obvious analogy is, of course, South Africa and the apartheid system. And in fact, if you read the Israeli human rights uh, material, they constantly make that comparison. Go look at Beth Selim's 2002 report, May 2002, called Land Grab. It's a big report, some 150 pages, which is large by a human rights report. And they say at the end that Israel has created a system unlike that of any other country in the world, and that it bears striking resemblances to repugnant regimes from the past, like the regime in South Africa. <coughs> or open up that Selim's March 2003 report called Forbidden Roads. And they talk about the Jews only roads that are being created in the occupied territories. And they compare them, they call them the apartheid road system. But here we're told, do not compare. Because when you compare it to apartheid, again, Israel comes out on the wrong side of the analogy. You're not supposed to compare because this, this conflict is so much more complicated. Is it? What's really remarkable when you read the documentary record and the historical record 
is how uncomplicated those documenting and writing the history thought it was. I'll give you a couple of examples. During the period from 1917 to 1947, Palestine was under what was called a British mandate. That is to say, the League of Nations told the British, you have the responsibility for ushering the Palestinians into a modern world and also helping to create a Jewish state in Palestine. And from nearly the beginning of the British mandate, the natives in Palestine were constantly restless. They were in engaged in riots, revolts, rebellions. Periodically, the history is punctuated with different rebellions, riots, and so forth, and revolts. And every time there was a rebellion, a riot, or a revolt, the British being excellent administ colonial administrators, they would send a parliamentary investigative team to figure out what's happening. Why are the natives so restless? And each time they came back and published the report, and the reports were of surpassing quality, both as literary exercises and sociological exercises, they were excellent. This was not Judy Miller. I mean, they were serious. <laughs> this was good stuff. And it repays even reading it nowadays. And if you open up the reports, the thing that's most striking is the word that keeps reappearing is obvious, 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 obvious. Why are the Arabs of Palestine, as they were called, why were the Arabs of Palestine so agitated? The British report says, the Peel report says, it's obvious because all the neighboring Arab countries are getting their independence or are on their way to independence except Palestine. So obviously, the natives are upset. And they say, these Arabs see all these Jews pouring into Palestine with the blessing of the British government and they're afraid that soon the Jews will be a majority, then the British will give them independence, and they're worried about their fate under a Jewish or an imminent Jewish government. The British say, that's obvious, not complicated at all. Now, it's true that they did say by the 1930s it was complicated how to resolve this problem, how to cut the Gordian knot. But they had no doubt about why this problem had arisen. And they were very explicit. It had nothing to do with ancient hatreds and enmities. And they ex immediately dismissed that idea as absurd. OK, now take someone like Benny Morris. He's a mainstream historian. You could say now he's in the right end of the spectrum. Some would say in the far right end of the spectrum. He's written a, a, a standard history of the Israel-Palestine conflict. I suspect some of you in this audience have either read it or use it in your classes. How many of you have read or used Righteous Victims? Uh, just more, fewer than I would have expected. Um, in any case, at one point, Morris confronts the question, why did the Palestinians resist Zionism? And his answer was quite interesting. He wrote, the fear of territorial dispossession and displacement was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. The fear of territorial dispossession and displacement was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. Now, some of you are wondering what's so profound about that, and why did I bore you by reading it twice? <laughs> well, in fact, when I came across that line in the history, the words, metaphorically, because I'm sober, leapt off the page for me. <laughs> why? Because 
Notice what Morris didn't say. He didn't say the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism was hatred of Jews. He didn't say it was anti-Semitism. He didn't say it was fear of the Enlightenment <laughs> or <laughs> dread of the emancipation of women. No. It's quite straightforward. It's uncomplicated. They were afraid, as it turned out, it was a very rational fear. They were afraid of losing their homes and losing their country. Not complicated. You don't have to search deeply for cosmic explanations. It happens that the obvious explanation also happens to be a sufficient explanation. And what's peculiar about the Israel-Palestine conflict is were the sorts of explanations that are typically uh, put forth in that conflict, were they put forth in any other conflict, people would receive them with ridicule. So let's take the case of North America. Now, there is no question that the Native American resistance to Euro-American encroachment was very brutal. The Native Americans, they killed men, they killed women, they killed children. Not to say the Euro-Americans didn't also, but we shouldn't be so politically correct as to forget that those, as it were, yesterday's terrorists, namely those savages, committed huge crimes. Though maybe by the 19th century they weren't considered crimes, but in retrospect, certainly. Uh, yet, what would anyone, what would any rational person, how would any rational person react if he were told or she were told that the chief motor of Native American resistance to Euro-American encroachment the chief motor was anti-Europeanism <laughs> or anti-whiteism or anti-Christianism. You would laugh. Why do you need an exotic explanation when the obvious one happens to be the right one? Why did the Native Americans resist? Well, to paraphrase Benny Morris, the fear of territorial dispossession and displacement. It's as uncomplicated here as it is there. A second kind of, in my opinion, fraudulent controversy surrounding the Israel-Palestine conflict is the dragging in, the hijacking of utterly or conscripting of utterly irrelevant issues and dragging them into the Nazi Holocaust. Most famously is the question of the uses and misuses, the abuses of the Nazi Holocaust in order to justify Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. I don't have time to discuss that now. It's a fairly large subject, not complicated, just large subject. Uh, I would only say, by way of brief comment, that the chief innovation of the Holocaust industry was putting forth this notion of what they called Holocaust uniqueness, or what's called the uniqueness doctrine, which is to say that never before in all of human history did anyone suffer the way Jews suffered during World War II. Well, Morally, the doctrine is an abomination, and intellectually, it's completely vacuous. <laughs> However, politically, it serves a very useful purpose. And the purpose is, if people have suffered uniquely, then they can claim unique moral dispensations, which is the fancy way of saying you can claim that because you suffered uniquely, you shouldn't be held accountable to the same ordinary moral standards. So if Israel demolishes homes as a form of punishment, 
methodically and systematically uh, tortures Palestinian detainees, legalizes hostage taking as it has and was the only country in the world to do so, you're always told, but remember the Holocaust, as if the special suffering gives you special moral dispensations. The most recent form of this uh, playing of the Holocaust card is what's called the new anti-Semitism, about which I suspect almost everyone has heard something, and probably most of you have heard more than enough. The new anti-Semitism claim first began to surface around the year 2000 or 2001, soon after the beginning of the Second Intifada. And there are two things to say at the outset about the new anti-Semitism. Number one, it's not new. And number two, it's not about anti-Semitism. In fact, every time Israel faces a public relations debacle, or it comes under international pressure to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict diplomatically, the new anti-Semitism extravaganza, extravaganza is revived. Examples, I was asking someone as I came in here the quality of your library. No library can possibly be worse than the library where I teach. Uh, I won't name the school because if this is taped, it will be on the internet and I'm, I'm over, I'm, I'm approaching retirement, so I'm hoping still to get tenure. Um, <laughs> in any case, even my library has the book. Go back to 1974, the ADL, the head of the ADL, the ADL is the Anti-Defamation League. It's the so-called chief or the main Jewish defense organization. It specializes in defaming the character of everyone who criticizes Israel. The ADL puts out a book by its head, Arnold Forster, and a colleague, Benjamin Epstein. Go check your library. The book is called, it has a black cover with the words in red emblazoned on it. It's called the new anti-Semitism. You go to 1981, the new head of the ADL is a fellow named Nathan Perlmutter. He and his wife, Ruth Ann Perlmutter, they put out a book. It's called The Real Anti-Semitism. Its thesis, there is a new anti-Semitism. <laughs> and then come 2000, there is a whole raft of books by the current uh, head of the uh, uh, ADL, uh, Abraham Foxman, as I prefer to call him, the Grand Wizard of the Jewish Citizens Council. Abe uh, <laughs> a, a, a Foxman puts out a book, the, the Old Never Again, and a whole uh, large number of books follow quickly on the same theme, as well as magazine cover stories and so forth. What's really remarkable about this claim of a new anti-Semitism is it's not only a theme that crops up every 15 or so years, even at the level of evidence, it remains consistent. So you open up the 1974 book by Forster and Epstein, and one of the centerpieces of their claim of a new anti-Semitism is this Broadway show that's just been turned into a film. And the Broadway show turned into a film. It's called, for those of you who, actually young people know, because I've mentioned it, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, yeah. And Foster and Epstein say this film, its lyrics, its score, everything, it's replete with anti-Semitism. And it's an interesting story. The director of the, of the film is a fellow named Norman Jewison. Now, no, no, no. Jewison is not Jewish, but his autobiography just came out. I was curious. I was thumbing through it. And Jewison says that ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to be a Jew. That was my thing. And he says when he grows up, he gets to meet Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel. He's very excited. And then he is told, we want you 
to direct Fiddler on the Roof. How many people know Fiddler on the Roof? Am I talking to Really? That's impressive. Um, even somebody just off the boat from India, he's waving his hand. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, and he's very excited. He's very excited, and he produces, directs Fiddler on the Roof, and he says, I'm a big hit. All the Jews love me. I'm now an honorary Jew. And then he says, something weird happened. I was then asked to direct uh, the cinematic version of Jesus Christ Superstar. I said, I did that, and all of a sudden, everyone starts calling me an anti-Semite. I said, I don't understand how that happened. What did I do? And it was not just Jewish sin. It was also the person who wrote the score for the Broadway show. It was a fellow named um, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Now, some of you may know Andrew Lloyd Webber. He went on to produce all of these other scandalous anti-Semitic productions like <laughs> Cats. <laughs> Many people say that's a coded reference to the Cats family. And he, too, was now being assaulted as an anti-Semite. And then Jewison says something interesting for me. Not trying to plug my book. True, it's been a disaster, I'll admit that, and every sale helps, but that's not, what I'm <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to do now. The first chapter of my book is called From Jesus Christ Superstar to Passion of the Christ. Because when I began researching the topic, I saw these obvious parallels between what happened to Mel Gibson and what happened to Jewison. And that was before the autobiography came out. And that's frankly why I was thumbing through it. I do read a lot, but I don't usually read books by Hollywood directors. And he says at one point, he describes what happens to him, and he said, what happened to me, it was exactly what happened to Mel Gibson. It had nothing to do with the film nothing to do with the content, the subject matter. It was used, it was exploited to whip up a hysteria about a new anti-Semitism. Is there any evidence for this new anti-Semitism? Let me give you two examples, one domestic, one international. Let's take the domestic case. If you read all of these books and articles on the new anti-Semitism, they claim a main focus of this new anti-Semitism is college campuses. College campuses are rife with anti-Semitism. I read that, and I have to say, I was kind of perplexed. Uh, I've taught at many schools, not by choice, I've taught at many schools, and one thing that you can say about educational institutions of higher learning nowadays is that they are so politically correct, for better or for worse, I think there are arguments on both sides, I tend to be liberal on that question, for better or for worse, they are so politically correct that you can't be anti-anything <laughs> on a college campus nowadays. You, cannot, you can't be anti-black, anti-Puerto Rican, anti-Mexican, anti-tool, anti anti-tall, anti-short, anti-fat, anti-skinny. You can't be even you know, anti-downright ugly. You can't be it on a college campus. So the idea that amidst all of this political correctness, there was rampant anti-Semitism on its surface seemed preposterous. And so I start to go through each alleged incident and each alleged incident proved on closer inspection to be simply fabricated. Now, I'm sure some of you will re receive that remark with a certain amount of circumspection, and I think you should. I don't believe anyone should believe authority. Uh, that was one good thing from the 1960s, that button questioned authority, or as Marx liked to quote, de omnibus dubitandum, 
which means to doubt everything. Okay, fair enough. You may say that the examples I looked at, the cases I looked at were skewed, that I had an agenda. That's fair enough. So let's take the best known case. As some of you remember, sometime last year, about a year ago, or maybe more than a year ago now, there was a huge hysteria about anti-Semitism at Columbia University in New York. And the newspapers were calling for professors to be sacked. Uh, politicians were calling for professors to be fired. Finally, the president of the university, Bollinger, had to put together an ad hoc committee to investigate the charges. Now, no one can claim the committee was biased in favor of the Arab professors because the special representative on the committee was Floyd Abrams, a First Amendment expert who also happened to be one of the chief endorsers of Alan Dershowitz's book, The Case for Israel. So there's no question here of bias. They, I mean bias against the Arab professors. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, in any event, they called witnesses, went through reams of material, Finally, they pr produce their report. What does the report find? It finds that, A, there is no evidence of anti-Semitism at Columbia. The only incident they found was, and now this is literally what it found, on one day, in one class, one professor responded heatedly to a student who was trying to defend Israeli actions in Jenin during the unfolding invasion in April 2002. That is it. From beginning to end, the whole hysteria about anti-Semitism being rife, rampant at Columbia. One professor on one day in one class responded heatedly to a student defending Israeli uh, military actions in Janine. That's it. That's the new anti-Semitism. But that's not all the report found. It also found that students were secretly videotaping the lectures of the Arab professors. It found that one professor in the medical school was instructing students to go into the classes of the, of the Arab professors and report back what the professor was saying. And it's interesting that in a report that began as an investigation of anti-Semitism, the most harsh or the harshest <coughs> conclusions were, it said, some professors are threatening to turn our students into informers. Now that's interesting. What began as an investigation of anti-Semitism turned out to be a revelation of the lengths to which Israel and its apologists are trying to suppress and terrorize dissenters into silence on our college campuses. And that's the real story about the new anti-Semitism. How this claim of a new anti-Semitism is being used as a weapon to suppress and silence open discussion on the Israel-Palestine conflict on college campuses. The final form of illegitimate um, controversy is in many ways the most dispiriting, at any rate, for an academic audience. And that is the vast amount of fraud, fakery, uh, fabrication that passes as bona fide scholarship in our system. Well, everybody knows that a lot of fraud a lot of hoaxes are concocted every day of every week of every year. That's not news. And it's fair to say, I think, 
70% of what you find on the web ranges somewhere between lunacy and crack pottery. Uh, in the case of what's said about me, I would say 95%, but that's, I admit, I have a personal prejudice there. Uh, so that's not news. What is news is the extent to which, when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict, sheer fakery and fraud is validated as bona fide scholarship and bona fide research. What do I mean by that? Let me take an example. Your name? Rahul. Rahul. Rahul comes over to me and he claims that in a book he's read, in a book he's read, it's documented that Israel's human rights record is generally superb and that everything I've said in the topic is bupkis, nonsense. OK, whenever you hear a challenge like that in academic life, uh, you, have what, you have more or less efficient mechanisms of quality control where I can test the validity of his claim or the validity of his source. So when Rahul says to me, I read in the book that Israel's human rights record is generally superb, I'll then start putting him to the test with the mechanisms of quality control. And they're mechanisms which everyone in this room knows. Nothing complicated, believe me. So I say to Rahul, really, generally superb, with that arrogant tone of a professor <laughs> and a squint. And I say, OK, Rahul, who published that book? And Rahul says, well, the book was published by John Wiley and Sons. I have to concede that's a good publisher because everyone knows in academic life you have a range of publishers and a range of qualities. On one end is sort of what you would call, what are called the vanity presses, that is people self-publishing. And then at the other end, what's considered the most impressive is the university presses because they have a policy of what's called peer review. Namely, others in your field have to evaluate the manuscript and give it a thumbs up before it's published. And certainly John Wiley, although not a university press, is on the mainstream end a solid publisher. OK, can't dispute that. So then I put the second question to him. I say, Rahul, who blurbed the book? That is, who wrote comments on the back? Everybody knows that. Most people, when they pick up a book, the first thing they do is flip to the, well, first the thing they do is check the index to see if their name is in it. And then they flip to the back. Um, you're nodding your head. Yes, you're in academia. Uh, uh, and then they, to check who endorsed the book. And Rahul says, well, who endorsed the book? This book got excellent endorsements. Floyd Abrams, the main civil liberty, uh, First Amendment specialist in the United States, the New York Times' counsel. Uh, then it got an endorsement from uh, Henry Louis Gates, well, of Harvard. That's impressive. And so forth. OK, I lose on that count. So now I ask him, OK, Rahul, who reviewed the book? What kind of reviews did it get? Another mechanism of quality control. And Raoul says, who reviewed the book? This book got excellent reviews. To give one example, it got an excellent review in the New York Times Sunday Book Review. And it was not just anyone who reviewed it. The reviewer was Ethan Bronner, who, who sits on the New York Times' editorial board. And he is their resident expert on the Israel-Palestine conflict. He writes all the editorials for the Times. OK, can 
quarrel with that, I don't think. So then I resort to the final mechanism of quality control. Raoul, who wrote the book? <laughs> and he says, who wrote the book? <laughs> who wrote it? The Felix Frankfurter Chair at Harvard Law School, the senior most professor of law at Harvard, Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> and, and in fact, it's true. Excellent publisher, excellent blurbs, excellent reviews, excellent <coughs> academic pedigree, I'd be the last to dispute it, senior most professor of law at Harvard Law School, and yet the book happens to be a complete fraud <laughs> from start to finish. <laughs> now, some people, some people dis debate where start begins. Some people say it's the first word of the first page. And some people say it's the Christian name of the author's name. So there is dispute on where. But it's for sure a sheer fraud and hoax from start to finish. In fact, it's such a preposterous hoax that large parts of it are plagiarized from Joan Peters's From Time Immemorial. Now, I have to tell you, I thought that was kind of funny. I did. I would be lying if I would tell you I, I was indignant. I really was not. I started to read the book. I said, that's familiar. <laughs> and I read on. I remember that. So I went to my bookshelf, dusted off my copy of From Time Immemorial, laid the two down on my bed, just like 20 years ago I was doing those those um, demographic studies, lay them side by, juxtapose them side by side, and I started to compare the quotes, and it was the same thing. And I, I thought it was sort of funny. You know, a Harvard Law professor, he plagiarizes. OK, that's pretty common at Harvard Law School, for those of you <laughs> who follow uh, the controversies, Lawrence Tribe, Charles Ogletree, they all you know, were found to have plagiarized. But it was funny. You, OK, you plagiarize, but plagiarize a hoax? <laughs> that was amusing. Uh, the, uh, it is um, pitiful, uh, but amusing. And then the heart of the book is, as I mentioned earlier, Dershowitz's claim that Israel's human rights record is generally superb. And he devotes large numbers of pages purportedly to documenting that claim and going through all the issues which all human rights reports go through, house demolitions, targeted assassinations, torture, and so forth. What's most striking, and I think it really is an illumination for those of you who are not so familiar with the topic, what's most striking is never once, I mean literally not once, in all of those chapters, devoted to documenting Israel's quote unquote generally superb human rights record, not once does he ever cite a single mainstream human rights organization to support his claim. Never cites Amnesty, never cites Human Rights Watch, never cites B'Tselem, never cites Physicians for Human Rights, never cites the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, leave aside the Palestinian human rights organizations, never cites any mainstream Western or Israeli ones. Not because he doesn't want to. Obviously, they have credibility. If you could, you would want to cite them to prove your thesis. He cites them to denigrate them. He never cites them to support his claim. Why? Not because he doesn't want to, but because he can't. Because it's impossible to cite any mainstream human rights organization report and reach the conclusion that Israel's human rights record is generally superb. The only possible conclusion you can reach is the record is generally abysmal and in certain respects uniquely 
abysmal. Uh, and that leads me to the last point. I wish I could claim that proving Dershowitz's fraud and hoax was an awesome intellectual achievement. But I cannot in all candor do so because the book was so preposterous. There are claims littering the pages like Palestinian suicide bombers are deliberately spreading AIDS and hepatitis B, that Palestinian female suicide bombers uh, blew themselves up because they had been raped by Fatah militants, all of this nonsense. It was so easy to just go through the human rights reports and juxtapose what Dershowitz claims against what the record shows. The challenge was not documenting it, but exactly what, like with Joan Peters, the challenge was publicizing it. As some of you know, Professor Dershowitz entered into a high profile public campaign to block publication of my book. He sent several long single space letters to my first publisher, all of which I've posted on my website. Uh, then we went, I went to another publisher, University of California Press. He began to bombard them with letters. Then he recruited the most powerful, what's reputed to be the most powerful law firm in the country, Cravath, Swain, and Moore, to block publication of the book. When that didn't succeed, he then went to the Terminator. He went to Governor Schwarzenegger of California <laughs> to try to get Schwarzenegger to terminate publication of the book. Schwarzenegger, to his credit, said that this was an issue of academic freedom and he wouldn't intervene. Whether he knew what that meant is an open <laughs> question. It was, it was still nice words. Um, and the book then went through a kind of extraordinary peer review process uh, because of fears of lawsuits. Uh, the book went through not one, not two, not three, not four, but five libel lawyers. Uh, I call them at the end the five humorless libel lawyers <laughs> because I like humor and they thought all my humor was potentially libelous and so they <laughs> struck all of it from the book. And then it had seven of the leading scholars in the world look at the book, a university chair at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, a university chair at Oxford, a senior researcher at Harvard, a chair in Judaic study, studies at Berkeley, and a chair at MIT among the seven go through the book. And they all gave it a very enthusiastic thumbs up. And the book was finally, notwithstanding Dershowitz's threats, it was published. And that would seem normally grounds for satisfaction. Uh, but you have to understand, I think, how our system works. The book had a huge amount of pre-publication publicity. It was the cover story of the Chronicle of Higher Education, many stories in Publishers Weekly, Los Angeles Times, Nation Magazine, because of Dershowitz's lawsuits, threatened lawsuits. Normally, when you have such a high profile book being published, reviewers are climbing over, scrambling over each other's backs to be the first to review it. The book came out in August which is to say now about six months ago, maybe more now, there hasn't been one, not one, mainstream review in the United States. Not one. Not one mainstream review in the United States. It's really awesome. You know, no, really it is. It's something awesome in the real, real sense of the word, not the way young people use it nowadays. <laughs> it's a subject of sheer awe. There hasn't been this level of party discipline since the glorious days of Anver Hocha of People's 
Albania. No, there really hasn't. Not since the glorious days of the glorious leader uh, Anver Hocha of Glorious Peoples Albania has there been this level of party discipline. They all know what to do. It's a marvel to behold. You take the case, for example, of Sarah Reimer at the New York Times. And she wrote this big article on plagiarism at Harvard because of the Lawrence Tribe case and the Charles Ogletree case. But she leaves out Dershowitz. And you ask her why, and Dershowitz quotes her in his book, his book that came after the case for Israel. And she writes, quote, I can't even understand the charges of plagiarism against you. Now, do you realize or can you comprehend the level of mental discipline? She doesn't say, I disagree, even though I have 25 pages of documentation. She doesn't say, I disagree. She can't understand the charges. Now, this is a very high level of you know, mental discipline. It's very impressive. And most of them, if you want to understand why, it's exactly the mentality of the 1930s, the Communist Party and the 1930s. There's the cause with a capital C. And then there are, there's truth with a capital T and truth with a little t. True <laughs> facts with an uppercase F and facts with a lowercase F. For these people, it's the cause. It's Israel. It's the Holocaust. Just like once before, it was the Soviet Union, and it was socialism. And then there is the big truth. The big truth is they're building socialism. The little truth is millions of people happen to be getting killed. But that's trivial next to the big issue, the big cause. They're building socialism. And it's exactly the same mentality. I don't think they're stupid. They know the truth. They know Dershowitz's book is nonsense. They know he plagiarized. They know he fabricated half of his sources, literally. But those are literal truth. Those are little truths, little facts. There is the big truth. And that's all that counts for these people. As Reagan famously put it, facts are stupid things. <laughs> they count for nothing. Truth with a small t counts for nothing. And when you have that kind of power, anything goes. Nothing is off limits. So for example, Professor Dershowitz comes under attack and I, whenever I bring in my personal family background, I get accused of exploiting my personal family background. But unfortunately, everybody else drags it in, and then I have to reply. It happens, both of my parents passed through the Nazi Holocaust. My mother was in, like my father, in the Warsaw Ghetto. My mother was then in Maidana concentration camp and two slave labor camps. My father was in Auschwitz, the Auschwitz death march, the whole thing. Every single member on both sides of the family, everyone, every single member was exterminated. Dershowitz becomes desperate because my findings are Sami's dot style being circulated. So he starts saying, Finkelstein suspects his late mother was a Nazi collaborator. Yes. He not only says that, he posts it on the official Harvard Law School website. It's right up there. And you know, it happens my late mother, apart from everything she went through, she was a witness at many of the Nazi deportation trials, both here and in Germany. OK, that's pretty offensive. <laughs> so I write the dean of Harvard Law School, Elena Kagan, and I put to her two questions, two simple questions. I say, Dean Kagan, is there anything I have ever written, anything I have ever written, from which one can reasonably infer that I think my late mother was a Nazi collaborator? Anything. 
Number two, do you have any limits, any limits on what's permissible on the first, on the Harvard, official Harvard Law School webpage? She replies through her public relations person, Michael Armani. She's too important to reply personally. And she replies, I'm not going to answer the first question. On the second question, she says, we have broad limits. OK. I say, fair enough. But broad limits is not no limits. So let me give you a hypothetical, Dean Kagan, via Michael Armani. Uh, <laughs> If, if a professor from Harvard Law School were to post on his or her website that, quote, Dean Kagan suspects her late mother was a whore, <laughs> would you allow that to stay up? Now, some of you are laughing. I ask you, because I was not joking. Which is more despicable? Which is more filthy to write that you suspect your, her mother was a whore or somebody who passed through the Warsaw Ghetto, Maidana concentration camp, two slave labor camps, every single member of her family was exterminated, and now she's dead. She can't defend herself. To now say there's reason to suspect she was a Nazi collaborator. But Kagan won't take it down. She will not remove it. It's the cause. And it's not just the cause. It's something else. And it's something I think that's useful to ponder. As I said at the beginning, one of the reasons people were so resistant to publicizing the, or to publicizing the Peters hoax was because what did it say about all the people who endorsed it? And one of the reasons I think they're so resistant to publicizing the Dershowitz hoax, what does it say about the most prestigious law school in the world, which it is, that its senior most professor is a sheer hoaxer and charlatan? That's a fact. That's not a ad hominem, that is a factual statement based on his written record. What does it say about the most prestigious newspaper in the world, that its resident expert on the Israel-Palestine conflict, about which there's quite a lot of coverage in the Times, that he praised the book? He's plainly and unequivocally an imbecile. <laughs> what does it say about the Times? And what does it say about Harvard? And that's another reason they have to suppress the reality. And the third one is, I think a lot of it is not a lot. A significant factor is me, because you know the expression blaming the messenger for the bad new for the bad message or news in the, in this case the messenger is the bad news <coughs> because there's the fear well if Finkelstein is right about this then maybe what he wrote about the holocaust industry that may be true as well and when that book came out the times had a full page in the sunday calling me every pass possible insult under the sun. As a matter of fact, I did do a comparison. Hitler's Mein Kampf got a much better review than the Holocaust. It did. It did. Hitler's Mein Kampf got a much better review than the Holocaust industry, even though the world's leading authority on the Nazi Holocaust, bar none, Raoul Hilberg, the author of The Destruction of the European Jews. Uh, he called my book, The Holocaust Industry. By the way, there's no ideological uh, consensus between us. He's a conservative Republican. Uh, he called the book a breakthrough. And he said, in years to come, people will be grateful for the kinds of research I did. <laughs> 
That's also unacceptable. That's all gloomy. So where is the silver lining in the cloud to end the evening, which has been a long one? In fact, in fact, I am not gloomy. Surely each day there is news which would cause us to be gloomy, but there is one central fact, one salient fact, which causes me to be optimistic and causes me to welcome the efforts of the Palestine Solidarity Group on campus and to remain hopeful about the future. And I'm not just saying it as a rhetorical flourish to end the evening. I believe it. What am I hopeful about? You have that perplexed look on your face. How can, the, after two hours and 20 minutes of all this, how can he be hopeful? Why am I hopeful? Because, as I said, the reason Dershowitz didn't quote the human rights reports, the reason everyone is trying to get us to forget the opinion of the International Court of Justice, uh, is because truth is on our side. It is. Justice is on our side. And I'm old-fashioned enough to believe that truth and justice, they are powerful weapons. If you learn how to wield those weapons, I still believe, I remain young in that sense, I still believe that although that side has lots of power, no doubt about it, and lots of money, no doubt about it. And that side is very ruthless, no doubt about it. Despite their power, despite their money, and despite their ruthlessness, I still believe if we learn to wield those powerful weapons of truth and justice, and they are our weapons. If we learn how to wield those weapons, I still remain hopeful and optimistic that we can win. Thank you. <laughs>